please, ladies and gentlemen. geeks and cinemaniacs from the heart of hollyweird california at the epicenter of all things eerie and awesome it's time for charles band's full moon freak show this week the freak show returns with a vengeance as i welcome writer director roger avery and his awesome daughter and producing partner gala avery Roger, of course, is the Oscar-winning co-writer of Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, the director of the 1993 crime caper Killing Zoe, as well as the writer of the modern horror masterpiece Silent Hill. Along with Roger's lifelong pal Tarantino, Roger and Gala are the co-hosts and co-creators of the scorching hot cult movie podcast Video Archives, a show that sees the movie mad trio select three awesome and obscure films on VHS from Quentin's library to watch every week and then completely and hilariously dissect them. Roger and Gala are the coolest father-daughter creatives ever, and I'm so excited to have them here today. Roger, Gala, welcome to The Freak Show. Yay! <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I am so happy to be oh, here. I sweet. really am. And you mentioned earlier that you don't do this too often, so it's even better that they don't. You're not on 900 other podcasts, right? I, I, I once you have a podcast and you're like, well, I've got to talk right. all the time on that. It's, <laughs> I don't want to burn myself out, and so I'm pretty um, selective. Uh, highly, yeah, I'm selective Good. about which ones I do. And uh, when you called, I was like, well, that's one I'm definitely going to do because <laughs> Charlie's my old boss. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, you know, I do have a memory of convenience. I admit yeah. this to everyone. And there are certain things that I just I don't have a memory. I erase in my mind. You know, Empire was a great experience. It ended sadly because it ended like many things do end. And then we formed Full Moon, uh, Full Moon Features or Full Moon Entertainment. But you were kind enough to bring some very rare – photos of you as a younger child yeah <laughs> as a projectionist at empire in 1987 maybe so I'll, I'll set the picture this was like 1986 and um i'm a student i'm a film student at art center college of design oh, okay. in pasadena okay. and i'm not really into advertising right. but um, where was gala she was not <laughs> even yet born. Not existing no, yet. I, not existing. I just like pointing that out. She was you know? merely My a parents thought. weren't even together. A dream. Yeah, a right. dream so that I would one day Floating around have. somewhere. Got it. <laughs> and so um, I, I was uh, – um, I'm at film school. Um, I, I got into a really, really, really big argument with uh, – a film theory argument with a teacher. Oh, God. And just uh, the words teacher. film theory. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, okay. Exactly. And um, – and, and the argument didn't end well. And then I thought about it. And I was like, well, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, I want to be making movies. Right. And, um, well, at that time, in the mid-'80s, uh, and I don't know if this is a com – I intended it as a compliment. Okay. <laughs> you were like the closest thing to my my dream, which was to work for Roger Corman. Right, right. Corman would, you know, frequently back in the day, uh, you know, he's making a movie. It's like a – 
biker film with like the Hells Angels and, right. you know, some bikini models or whatever and put it all together in a women's prison. And, yeah. Well, you know, he would, you know, we got a movie. Exactly. And then, you know, he would hire somebody who was like passionate. He's like, well, as long as they get it in focus. And, right, you know, right, right. Kid seems to know what he's doing. Right. <laughs> and so um, Corman wasn't really doing that as much by the time uh, it was you. Right. And you were making all these like great, crazy genre films. And I was like, well, that's the path. And so I dropped out of school right. uh, on the promise of a job. I went and I interviewed with, uh, with actually, with this person. Okay. This was Julie. Uh, Julie Avola. Avola, wow. who okay. was the post-production um, uh, coordinator, I guess, okay. or supervisor, mm-hmm. or at least a, a post person there. And um, and she hired me as a runner projectionist wow. working for you. Well, you looked the role kind of. Young kid, full of enthusiasm. You know, you kind of look <laughs> like the part, I think. I, I almost feel, as I reflect, I've been, you know, as I've been preparing for this podcast, I've been reflecting back on those times and what I must have been like to uh, mm-hmm. to have been working for you. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's like I'm a projectionist. I'd never run a projector in my life. Right. You know, good yeah, good for you. I think I lied. I said, oh, yeah, I run projectors, no problem. Right. And they hired me and I had to yes. figure it out. I love and, it. Um, and, and. I consider 86 into, you know, 87. I, I think I left around summer of 87. Um, I considered that almost like this kind of magic period. Here's a picture of me actually at the projector. And when, uh, and here's one, I think my caption for this in my photo album was, it operates much like a microwave oven, <laughs> which was <laughs> kind of the, the case. Funny. Here I am. Uh, spreading out and lounging. Well, well that picture and... is when the, the the top brass, meaning me and my dad and a few other characters, weren't there. You got to be like a, oh, complete. And I remember actually buying those uh, theater seats. I mean, there are little slivers of memory that are bizarre, but just uh, just having a screening room. Well, for me at that age and as Empire was exploding was just so cool. When I think about it now, and and I I can't say that I thought about it then, but I definitely was gravitated to you like a moth to the flame um, because of what you were doing. And to, to get a job there and then as a projectionist, you know, to be able to work in the uh, um, and see the dailies as they right, were coming in right, and then right. working under, because you had like staff editors. Yeah. You had like, you know, uh, union editors, yeah. you know, yeah. working there who were like, you know, just, okay, what's coming in? We've got, you know, some <laughs> Gorman Bouchard movie. <laughs> you got to edit that. Yeah. And these guys were like, man, what? The, like, how, you know, the, from those Gorman Bouchard films, you would get like, uh, I don't mean to slag on Gorman no, Bouchard, no, but no. you would get a master, maybe an insert. It was not awesome. Okay. Maybe another, what, what, maybe another let's master. Let's talk to some of the more you know, <laughs> awesome movies that may have come through the, well, the year or so. What? The earlier ones when, when I first came in, and, and it was like I consider it kind of peak empire because I right. think I was there during – I think it was your most expensive film at the time. You had just purchased the De Laurentiis yes. uh, stages Indeed. in yeah. Italy, and you were like cranking production out there. And they were all these like – I mean from beyond I worked right. on. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. And then all, like all the Stuart Gordon movies okay. basically. Uh, I was there for Crawl Space. Wow. Which is – a movie, and I, th- I watched it again recently. It's and awesome. Like, wow, I really, that had an effect on me. Like watching the production of that, I've copied things in that movie since okay. then, I've noticed. <laughs> like, well, you know, Klaus Kinski, I worked with bizarre and volatile actors, but he was actually dangerous, could be dangerous, because I broke up a fight on the lot, you know, at the great Empire Studios, which had a brief It's legendary. The, and, the, you know, the he, he wanted to slit Schmuller's throat because of a the lack of some kind of a close-up. I don't know what was going on. It was just intense. You pay extra for that. (laughs) You hope that he's going to do that. I ended up working with Rutger Hauer later on in my life, and I had a very similar experience. And actually, knowing what had happened Mm -hmm. with Klaus Kinski kind of in some ways actually prepared me for (laughs) what I was going through. I was like literally having my Schmoller moment, (laughs) moment. as one might call it. But I also, most importantly, I worked on Robo Jocks or Robot Jocks or Crash and Burn. Way ahead of its time. I mean, that was no phony baloney CGI. We built all those. I watched that movie again. And you had Ron Cobb doing all of the robot designs. Mm -hmm. And I watched uh, the movie again recently. And it's so good. It holds up. (laughs) Gary Graham is great in the movie. It's almost like a, you know, at the time when I was watching dailies, because I never saw the movie other than rough cuts, you know, put together. I never saw it fully finished. Right. um, After that. It, um, but watching it now, in in the moment I was watching it thinking, this looks like kind of weird looking. Everything's very like, 
but now watching it now, it's like, wow, it's it's Starship Troopers before Starship Troopers. You're or right. like, you know, You're it's right. got this kind of. 35, man. And Dave Allen's amazing stop motion. The stop and, motion yeah, is yeah. beautiful. And that giant nightmare robots. sequence, like the effects on the nightmare sequence. And we built all that. Yeah. So you know, good. this was no, no cheating, you know. Oh, no, no everything is constructed. Built, everything know. is built. You feel the hand of man <laughs> yes, on that yes. movie. And oh, it's. And, and it. it it's a film that feels like it's been copied, you know, uh, since then, you yeah. know, numerously, so, but uh, right. or okay. not copied in a, in a, f- it inspired other works. It definitely <laughs> is an inspirational, inspirational movie. So, so, so that is amazing. Then I'm so glad. The Caller. I worked on The Caller. The, the caller, Malcolm. So I got, yeah. you know, Malcolm McDowell. Well, you see, I had my you were at the, ta- you know, if you look at the history of all these companies, forget mine, as they wither away, you know, the, the movies, I was going to say the content, which I hate saying, the movies get thinner and more weird, you know. So you were there at the peak, and you kind of towards Ghoulies the end. Ghoulies too. Ghoulies too, and then Gorman Bouchard. Then you kind of <laughs> yeah. witnessed, you know. Well, once the Gorman Bouchard Club Earth uh, <laughs> yes. stuff started coming that in, was, or was towards um, the end, was it Princess Academy? Might have All been that. one. Valet um, Girls was another. You know, there was a guy named Rafael Zelinsky. Oh, I think God, he did Princess yes. Academy. Actually, I he became did. friends with him. I yeah. bumped into him at a film festival, and it was like, yeah. dude, right, right, Princess right. Academy. And he was like terrified. <laughs> like <laughs> when I. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I remember. I think on that one we had like a big um, premiere at a drive-in theater. Was oh, that or God, was that yeah. the, like Drive-in Girls? It was one of those. Val- no, no. Um, and Angeline was there, and I remember. Like I was like, yeah. man, I've made it. I'm in Hollywood. Right, right. I'm in this cool building. <laughs> yeah. on and then a year later, we were out of business or something. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk to speak okay, to that, okay. but there it's was fine. that day when it was like over. It's collapsing, yeah. and now suddenly we're pushing moviolas and stuff That's across right. the street, <laughs> across right. La Brea, to the other building. No, no. Uh, this is Full Moon's property. <laughs> exactly. So, yes, that happened. And <laughs> yes. luckily, I, I – Which is a I, great I, thing I, I, for I a get, young guy you know, with a sack you, over his shoulder coming into Hollywood few, to experience that. For a few that. short years, we were just rolling. I, you know, I briefly owned the Dino De Laurentiis Studios. Yeah. I mean, going there and shooting those movies – of course, if money was better, I'd say, come on over, Roger, just to, for the experience. Sorry that never happened. Because you was, were stuck on La Brea. Well, I but. kind of realized that um, working there, it like I looked at the scenario of what was going on, and I was comparing it to – I was literally every day thinking, mm-hmm. okay, this is what Corman's studio, they did this, <laughs> and da, 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 da. Who, Am I Joe Dante in this situation? Mm-hmm. Am I uh, Jenny Kaplan? Who, right, am, right. who am I? Like, how can I do this? And I started thinking, okay, I'm like – five or six people behind, like in in line to be able to make a movie here if I bust my ass. <laughs> That's great. I'm like about five people behind. If I really worked it and I, I started right. calculating the time and it wasn't happening fast enough and suddenly it was all this Gorman Bouchard stuff coming in. It, it was, the RoboJox That's was right. done. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, uh, Crawl Space was done. Even Rawhead Rex had like uh, kind of come and gone. And so, and so oh, I- That's right, Raw. Oh my goodness. Now I'm flashing back. But <laughs> I will say that, you know, in spite of how it was a bummer that it ended, but it didn't end it in a fireball. It probably felt that way to people who were moving the mobiles across the street. It just – I had to settle up with the bank, which I did. Yeah. You know, never had a bankruptcy. Just It just ended. And literally, I wanted to learn from these mistakes because a lot of the problems is the bank was kind of forcing us to distribute other people's products. Right. So – when Empire, Empire was at its peak, those were really our movies, my movies. And then you had those other bizarre movies you've been talking about. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start a new label. It's going to be only our movies. And I literally six months later started Full Moon, made a deal with Paramount, and made Puppet Master. Yeah. So there was just a moment in time, like a bummer. Then you just because if not forward motion, you're it's over, you know, in this business. Well, like one of the guys I worked with, um, who was like ahead of me in line, okay. we can say <laughs> we, we can actually say I that. I love this. <laughs> like was yeah. King Wilder? Do you remember oh, King? Sure. He, okay, he. Um, I love King. First of all, he had the better name. He's it's the like, guy that took the photos. Could, we think. Yeah, I think uh, he's the one who took. But these he photos. also. If, I mean, I hope I'm not mistaking this memory. He, I think, married Julia Vola. He married Julia. Right. Okay. There you go. See? Uh, 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 Briefly, maybe. I yeah. Don't know. No. No. I think. I think the. I. Th- I mean, to my knowledge, they're still together. I haven't talked to okay. King in many, many years. And if King's out yeah. there, like, hey, King, hey, Julie. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, not only did King have the name, King was he was ahead of me, and I, and I stayed friends with him for years after right. that. And he um, uh, he became an editor. And I think okay. did you know he did Scotty Spiegel's film The Intruder, and which uh, is my movie, yeah, I mean, which you d- films, yeah, which yeah. is one of your movies, and uh, and um, and then uh, I think he edited a movie for Adam Rifkin. Okay, cool. Um, I occasionally because I'm again I'm in. But this, then he ended up directing I, I, the the Ultraman series, okay. and so I, I like I look at him, I'm like, man, he. 
he's like one of my heroes, actually. Oh, King, like okay. he he Good. was on that path, that right. kind of that filmmaker path. Because you were a few below. Whatever. <laughs> I was a few behind. I was a few oh, behind, man. and it wasn't going to happen fast enough for me. And I wanted to like I wanted to I wanted to jump right to the front of the line. Well, <laughs> uh, and, and look where we are right now. Yeah, you know? I guess so. I will say that um, because again, I'm. I'm in this bubble. I, I don't have much time to do anything, honestly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm delighted. I'm happy. And I don't really keep track of all these characters unless someone reminds me. I do have some friends who go back to the 80s and go, Charlie, guess what happened to so-and-so? And, and then I suddenly I'm looking at the credits of, I don't know, a big movie. And there he is or there she is. Yeah. So a lot of these people over the years did – move on you know, well. I mean, they did good, you know, in well, terms of the if business. If you think about L.A. during that time, mm-hmm. like late 80s, what you were doing was, like you said, you were the, like, like you were a genuine, like, theatrical distributor yeah, studio. That. You were yeah. a studio. And, you know, yes, you're making ghoulies and stuff yes, like that. but Which did very well. <laughs> which, those were hits, right. man. Those were hits. And, and I think actually Ghoulies 2 wasn't like that your dad's like first film in like 10 years or yes. something and, and as again, a director. So I was there for that. Okay. And that was really cool for me. And my dad, <laughs> who was just so awesome, and I really miss him. He was such a big part of the, you know, he, he used to call it reverse nepotism because he worked for me for many years mm-hmm. until he passed away. But... Um, there was a point where he said, you know, I should get out and direct one of these things. And I don't know how Ghoulies came into the picture. And, you know, talk about a complete bunch of nonsense as far as trying to justify why would we spend that kind of money, build that set on a soundstage at the ex Dino De yeah. Studios for a movie called Ghoulies. It made no sense. And that was an expensive set. We literally, all that gear was erected at night so that you can have a night scenes. In the biggest sound stage, one of the biggest sound stages in yeah, Europe. It was. Yeah, yeah I think it was, it was, if I look back, I think, well, what was I thinking? I didn't need to do that for Ghoulies too, but my dad had a great time, so maybe that's the uh, well, the justification. But my it turned dad them all into studio films. Like, yeah, even, they, that's true. That's even true. Crawl Space, you know, it's like you can go into locations and shoot all of that, but um, it has a kind of it has a studio feel it to does. it. It does. Like, and, and, and the better ones, it. It has a uh, handcrafted from Beyond feel. Dolls, oh, Troll. From beyond. You know, th- those are movies that I'm really proud of that. Benefited yeah, from Yeah, I worked that. on Troll also. You yeah. did? Yeah, I worked oh on Troll Oh, my God. Well. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually almost embarrassed. I didn't remember this. Well, you know? I, it's funny. It was I, Chris said, hey, and Roger worked for you as a projectionist. I'm thinking, because I didn't. I then had briefly another great facility, the early days of Full Moon. Yeah. And we also had a, a projection room. And I was trying to rack my brain. But no, this is the 80s. <laughs> right? this yeah, this was. Not the early 90s. This was 90s. the 80s. And then I went off and I, you know, found my way and did my thing. But I've thought about it. And, you know. When I look at my first film, Killing Zoe, Killing mm-hmm, Zoe, mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of that movie came from what I learned at you know while working sure, for you, sure. while seeing these low budget productions right. um, do the like do fantastical mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to do that. I'm going to keep my locations to a minimum. Good for you. I'm going to keep my <laughs> actors to a minimum. So it worked. It just was another. You know, few years. It took years. me. A, it took me a little while. It took me a little. The truth is, I went and I worked for um, on a. I, I I decided to travel around Europe. I decided mm. to. I'm going to tour the continent for a wow, while. I man. I left uh, um, after leaving Empire. What I should have done is I should have gone to uh, Italy right. and tracked down your castle or something. I probably yes. would have been able to arrive around the time you're making Castle Freak. Yes. <laughs> like, I probably or could pit have in the pendulum, possibly. Or maybe pit in the pendulum. Right. One of those. God, you and, know all this stuff. <laughs> this is a good moment for me to give you guys. A, I've got a few things that you're oh, yeah. surprised with. So, you know, Harper Collins came to me and somehow they got wind of my bizarre history. And um, during COVID, when there was less action, um, I worked with a wonderful um, biographer, a guy named Adam Felber, and I wrote this book. And it's got all these adventures and more, including me going to the slammer and everything else. Oh, really? Things that you don't even know. So this is for both of you, Roger and Excellent. Gallup. And I, and, you know, I recently, well, not recently, maybe a year and a half ago, ran into uh, Quentin Tarantino at a bagel shop because he was on the lot of, I think, maybe, I forget which studio. Maybe it was where we had our offices uh, at um, Raleigh Studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we, we were hanging out and talking about the old times. I, I knew him back in the, uh, the early days, I guess the Pulp Fiction days. We said hi on occasion. So we're there at the bagel shop talking about stuff. And um, 
you know, it, it dawned on me because we were talking about Trancers actually, which is another movie that Trancers is great. The Jack Death, yeah, Jack Death, and there's a yeah, good, what's this, this road like? Kawianga, <laughs> like he's <laughs> that is one of the funniest lines. Yeah, he uh, quotes that in the car all the time yeah. whenever we pass. Whenever that we go is, to Kawianga, yeah. uh, oh, <laughs> but I, you know, we started talking briefly about Italy, and I'm the only living human who grew up on the sets of all these spaghetti westerns yeah. that he loves so much. And hanging out with the whole production with Sergio Corbucci. Yeah, you have like I have all that. Yeah, it's like so your anyway, dad this, was producing so this, those this movies. Is, I, this is yeah. whenever you see Quentin. This is for. Oh yeah, well we'll see him well, this week. Well, so you, this is for Quentin. And I said one day come over here, and I'll tell you all the Corbucci stories. Many Corbucci stories that no one knows because I lived with that guy for a month. Well, I'm going to push him to get on because I'd like to hear those too. Okay, they're, they're, <laughs> so they're, they're, I'm going to be honest, or we have to bring Charlie on. <laughs> oh yeah, to become a Actually, customer. I'm ready. At I'm ready. Archives. I love this stuff. You know, Actually, I also. Yeah. Have only done a few podcasts because I'm so busy. It's like the time, but I would be happy to. Yeah. Because because it would honor. be an honor to have yeah. you on, and we would that would give us a reason to crack open uh, <laughs> everything. Like for Quentin, whenever a guest comes on, you know he's wanting to. It's this very like complicated <laughs> mathematical a, thing that he does. He wants to have a movie he hasn't seen, a movie that the person that's coming on hasn't seen. And then maybe a movie that they've worked on or something that's they can talk about. But he also about. wants something that's going to compliment them. Like, so it's it's a delicate, you that's know, fine, it's a delicate right. broth. You know, you learn he, he after doing this for you just roll with anything. You just go with the flow. That's fine. I mean, you guys have seen a hundred times more movies than I've seen. I've actually am not. I mean, I've seen a reasonable amount of films, but nothing like you guys. Not even close. And, and you know. Especially now. We're watching a lot. If you're you watching know. a lot. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's for crazy. every one movie that we show, I'm watching like four, it seems. And then we're frequently watching films and then we don't get to record it right away. And by the time we get to record it, it's like, well, the energy is gone. Right. <laughs> like we're no longer. We're all, we've already moved on from it. And so there's spectacular movies that I wish we had. Uh, and I have to find the time to rewatch some of those movies that I grew up watching on the big screen. I mean, I saw back in the day. In the 60s, just about every spaghetti Western because of my involvement, or my dad, I should say, his involvement with Sergio Leone because he, my dad shot a movie at the exact same time in the same area. And I, I grew up literally hanging out with Clint Eastwood who was going to this low-budget Italian movie called Fistful of Dollars. <laughs> and my dad was making A Minute to Pray, A Second to Die, which, had, which was more expensive because it had Robert Ryan and uh, who, I forget who else was in the film. So, you know, I was in that world. And then the Corbucci movies and all that was just fantastic. But I would watch those movies always on the big screen because I enjoyed those movies as a kid in Italy. I was a teenager. Um, and, of course, always in Italian. So yeah. I had to rediscover these movies later, the few that I've seen again in English. Because my whole yeah. – I just grew up in Rome. So it was all Italian. And really, these were amazing comic book movies for sure. Wow. I, um, what a time. Like, yeah. That must have been for you. And then, <laughs> amazing. And then for you, like, – because you guys had that – studio there and you had the castle well that was so you were like building up that was years later it literally was was an empire it It was it was (laughs) <laughs> and we're building it again in the digital world. I'm going to get off the whole projectionist thing. I'm going to like Never. move on no, from no, it. No, no, let's but, keep rolling. But keep, keep rolling. I just want to apologize yeah. because I, I, I have like my vivid memories of working there is probably the reason I ultimately left and realized this is probably not for me <laughs> is every time I would be projecting for you, uh. you'd be picking up that phone to call to the back and be like, this fuck it to get it. Like the, the heads are getting like frame it. God damn it. I know, I know, and I'm terrible. framing it. And, and I'm sorry if I was ever. No, rude, well, I was yeah. thinking about it today as I was driving in. I was terrible. like, you know, I was a terrible, terrible, awful projectionist. <laughs> That's great. And I started thinking about it. I was like, well, like a lot of the Mac Alberg stuff, I'm sure right. was, uh, well, um, he framed we, properly. And that was me mistaking it. If that was that, but I'll no, bet no, no, that no, it was no, the no, Gourmet he, Bichard movies that were coming in, th- that's that those pro- were yeah. well, misframed and that fault, it wasn't though. actually my yeah, fault. When, when you're spoiled with <laughs> Mac Alberg's <laughs> cinematography and those budgets, and then you kind of wind up with the Gorman Bichard stuff, not to put Gorman if he's out there. I didn't mean to. Good luck, mean, Gorman. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Mac it's, always it's, shot full frame. He composed for 185. So it's not your fault. You know, you could be anywhere in that frame. Trying to well, yeah, because you're also over. You're in. In fact, this is something as a projectionist that I should have known when I shot my first film is that that safety is not really a safety when right. you're when you're the full academy frame when you're shooting one eight five. My DP was like, oh, it's it's safe, and we never had enough time because right. I was trying to do too much on too little. Right, and so I'm pushing through everything on killing Zoe, and so frequently there would be tracks okay. in the safety or a microphone, a boom right. in the safety up above. Mm. But that safety is not a safety when you go when you. 
put it all on a four by three right. television. Right. right. Suddenly it's like, well, there's my tracks. Well, now there we have is. all the tricks. Yeah, I should have known so. that as a protectionist. Nah. I should have paid more attention. No, 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 you did just <laughs> fine. You got out of there just in time. <laughs> so now what? Okay. So the tra- trajectory of your whole thing. So that wasn't your first job. Was that your first? That job? was my first. Oh, really? Legit oh, industry okay. job. But then, um, what, well, then what? Happened? Actually, actually, no. Quentin and I had a job working as uh, PAs on a Dolph Lundgren exercise video. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. We in did, the 80s. In the, before the Empire thing. Before, just before Empire, just prior to that. <laughs> That's and, unbelievable. And so, you know, it was literally it. like, uh, okay, boys, uh, Dolph is going to be picking up. I mean, Dolph is going to be doing aerobics on this hill right. with a bunch of girls in Venice. Of course. And uh, there's it's covered in dog shit. So right. you guys go up there. Here's some paper towels. Go up there and, you know, clean that up. Up there, like cleaning I, it I, up. That, this <laughs> reminds me of a good <laughs> story uh, shooting westerns in Italy in the 60s. Although, I'm not going to spoil the Corbucci stuff. That's when Tarantino and I'll tell him all yeah, sorts yeah. of crazy Corbucci You can do a, a, soft spo- a soft spoiler to, uh, <laughs> as a lost Entice leader him. towards lost that leader. episode. No, no, but back <laughs> to you cleaning up the shit. Yeah. So, I was enamored of show business. I didn't want to make the movies my dad necessarily was making. I wanted to make horror movies. Yeah. But he didn't make, you know, I Bury the Living. He made a, really, a few cool horror films. But growing up on those Western sets, yeah. um, I, I, he had me apprentice doing everything. I mean, I can literally do just about everything. I can do jobs that are obsolete today, like like numbering negative, you know, which I'm a terrible. I'm terrible. I don't know how they're Maybe not my... as obsolete as we think. Well, maybe not. No, no, but they have machines now. This was with a fountain pen yeah. with a white ink numbering the negative. To, yeah, anyway, God, that's... The only job, speaking of... It's so tactile, though. That's so... Um, yeah. <laughs> handmade. It's so loving. Yeah. It's so handmade. Oh, everything, the thing, the tape. Anyway, but the one job he didn't have me do, and he was always kidding around that, you know, that he's going to spare me, is the job of the poor guy or guys sometimes who had to clean up the shit when the horses rode in the town. Oh, yeah. Like 20 horses. No one ever thinks about that, that no, no, job. Because, <laughs> all right, eh, we got to do it again. Yeah, They all ride out. Yeah. And of course, they leave all their little gifts everywhere. Yeah. So there's someone or two people came out to sweep all that, sh- literally yeah. all that shit up. You have to reset. You have to reset. And it was always horse shit everywhere. Yeah. Just apropos your dog shit story. Yeah. Mine was probably also being Venice human shit. That's what <laughs> it was. Like, way, it was probably that that's as a well. That's a <laughs> But, um, All right, so you uh, so did I, that. So, I, so we worked on that, and then um, uh, and then I was at school, and then I found my way into uh, Empire. Empire. Um, but what about this video store thing? Was that after? That was or kind of you know because it was like a video store that I I mean I started working at video archives. I mean it must have been nineteen. When it, when it first opened, like the, it first opened. Mid-80s, so, early 80s. I'm, I'm thinking I was, uh, the store closed around, I'm thinking, because I w- started off working at the store video outtakes. And then. Oh, happened, I remember that. And then that sort of kind of transitioned into right. um, video archives. And oh, like, okay. the owners split up and one of them took his, you know, uh, inventory with him. And uh, <laughs> what a business. <laughs> yeah, what a business at every level. At every level. And, um, and we started, you know, this new store. And that's when, you know, Quentin got hired to that store. Right. And uh, that's when just, you guys met and hung out and all yeah, that. Yeah. And, you know, became fast friends. And then right. it became like while I was at school. Was and, that before the Empire thing or after? Uh, that was before. Before. And then, oh, wow. so I would go to, uh, you know, I'd, go to school I I would work there and then not work there for a month and so right. I it, it was like my off and well on job paid, for sure. yeah. highly paid right for the <laughs> exactly I wasn't working there necessarily for the pay although in those days a guy and a, or a girl could work at a video store mm-hmm. earn minimum wage and still go see a movie survive. every yeah, day maybe go see several movies over the weekend right. and rent an apartment and live and yep eat. And eat. Yeah, and eat. Like right. it was still possible back okay. then to, yeah. to do that. And so you could chase your dreams in Hollywood. That's true. Keep a, you know, a low income right, job right, right. while you're trying to get, you know, the big time at, yeah. at uh, Charlie Band's Empire. <laughs> oh, God, <that's> and <laughs> well, no, but literally that was to me, that was the uh, just it was it was huge for me. Right. So then um, uh, I worked at Empire for a while and then I decided to uh, go on a go on a European trip 
clear my head a little, so to speak. <laughs> it's sort of the sabbatical, right? And you didn't, I, yeah, I went and I went backpacking By across yourself? Europe. Yeah, I went with a friend, but we friend. pretty much broke. We this is before flew there marriage. Together. This is like before marriage, the, the, before the, the, everything. Okay. I actually met my wife when I returned from that trip. Now, the wife has in your mom? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta ask. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> figure all this out. That's true. My my first and only wife. Okay. And wow. um, uh, when I returned um, from Europe, uh, a friend of mine had and of Quentin's had committed suicide. And I was... And it, actually, the, one of the employees at Video Archives, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. was... Uh, and, and at Video Outtakes. He yeah. was actually the son of the guy who owned Video Outtakes. And he had committed suicide. And we were like filmmaker friends. We right, were like... Right. We were like, you know, if... It would be like... Uh, I mean, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but it would be... The analog might be if Joe Dante... Uh, you know, if, if Jonathan Kaplan had suddenly committed suicide no, or that. something like that. that. Like two guys who were right. like close friends yeah. who were rising together and then suddenly one of them's you. gone. And I struggled with that for a while. And it, you know, put me into a weird place. And then I met his, her mother. And, right. Yeah. Uh, How long were you in Europe? What was that? It was uh, like... Um, Probably only four or five months or That's so. That's a lot. But a That's lot, a big chunk of time. But a lot happened during, you know, right, it's like right. I, a lot happened in my life. I've put a lot of that into my work. Um, you know, if you watch this movie, I did Rules of Attraction. Uh, there's an entire yeah, sequence. Yeah, Chris is saying it's terrific. Yeah. I have to. I'm going to now. I'm going to catch up on something. <laughs> yeah. It's embarrassing. No, it's, it's not embarrassing at all. It's it's a very particular kind of film. Okay. It's a movie that Empire would – although I made the movie at um, Lionsgate. And, but okay. Because you know, I made the movie – originally my budget for the film mm-hmm. was like $10 million. It was actually just under $10. It was $10 another, million? I know. I know. The, uh, well, it was, I was like, it was, well, it was a very ambitious Dude. movie. And so Jeez, I budgeted the film at $10 million, just under 10 <laughs> just under 10 9 9 million technically well everyone called bullshit on that it was like this is not going to happen right but i had a huge budget actually which was 4 and change like i like 4 2 i think is what i ended up with okay at at lionsgate and um uh, with that, I was able to do amazing stuff. But they had this other movie, Cube 2, that was a problem at that the time. That rings a weird bell. Yeah, it was a- Andre Sekula, who uh, shot Pulp Fiction, was directing his first film, right. Cube 2. Cube. <laughs> and the first Cube is a great movie. I haven't seen Cube 2. Mm. I own it, but I haven't yet right. watched Cube 2. <laughs> I just like saying funny. Cube 2. Yes. Um, and uh, that was the problem film at the studio at the time. And... All of their focus was on that, and that was like a big uh, franchise for them, right. the Cube franchise, really? I yeah, guess. Yeah, I was, Cube was a hit for them okay. and, a, and a very small contained movie because it's just inside right. of a Cube. <laughs> so um, uh, because they were paying attention to that, they didn't pay attention to me at all. And I made Good this for very you. abstract. So you kind of got to do your shtick, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a very abstract – I mean maybe not very abstract, but it's right. a very um, – it has an uh, – an, Unusual narrative. Okay. The book cool. had an unusual narrative, and so the movie also has that. Right, and right so on. it was – Killing Zoe is much more of like – I was trying much more to stay inside the tenant right. of okay. uh, what I would call the the band ethic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like the, yeah. yeah. That's – now, how do we jump forward to a gala? Okay. Uh, so that's but you, the thing, the video store, your friendship with Quentin, all that's happening. Then you're making these movies. Yeah, I made we're looking movies. at. I, I went off yeah. and I made this little uh, crazy. Uh, it was a it was a TV pilot actually with Rutger Hauer. Which one was that? What it was, was called Mister Stitch. And Mr. Stitch. It was well, like a. It's possible? very difficult to see. Uh, it probably shows up <laughs> on YouTube every now and then. I am the one trying to take it down, and YouTube no. won't take it down. Oh, it's like the opposite it. of you know, copyright. We, we, we just. <laughs> oh, it's the opposite. Right? It's like, like the opposite. Like they're right, they're right. forcing to 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 show it. Yeah. <laughs> I had a penny for the millions of views on my movies on you, and just and I have one guy who spends part of his week just. Hey, guess what? I just saw this crash, a movie I made 600 years ago. I, oh, that has 2 million views. Like, God damn it. It was yeah, crazy. It's 2 million uh, rentals. Pennies. Yeah, it's 2 million. <laughs> Whatever. 2 million dollars potentially. Whatever, whatever. If a 99 yeah. cent rental maybe. Even a dime would be fine. Even a give me dime a, give me a dime. would be okay. It, so you did that. So you've been making movies. And so, I, so I did that. It was not a very good experience. However, uh, her mother became pregnant during that time. And <sighs> shortly thereafter, and I returned to the United States after. Uh, Wait, but after you came back. 
Uh, yeah, just right. shortly after I came back. It almost sounds like she became pregnant, and then you came back. <laughs> well, like, she, what's going on she here? Might, she might have become pregnant right before <laughs> I no, came back. No, no, stop, stop. But like, um, uh, just right around post-production on that, um, during the Academy Awards, when we were suddenly nominated for Pulp Fiction, which, I mean, you have to remember. That's amazing. I mean, the thing is, uh, I didn't know Pulp Fiction was going to be this right. massive hit. Amazing. Uh, you know, Reservoir Dogs was in the United States made less money than Leprechaun. Right. So <laughs> it wasn't really considered like this smash right. hit here. Mm-hmm. It was a smash hit in Europe. It was. In yeah. Europe, they looked yeah. at it like, you know, on equal footing with everything else. Right. It wasn't like a college town release. And, and, and that is true, by the way. Leprechaun smoked it. <laughs> okay. Stay tuned. There's more Freak Show after this quick break. Enter the terrifying world of Delirium Magazine. Horror, sci-fi, thriller, exploitation, exclusive interviews, jaw-dropping photos. Subscribe today at www.deliriummagazine.com and www.fullmoonhorror.com. It's the wildest movie magazine around. Delirium. And now back to The Freak Show. Uh, Pulp Fiction was a big hit. Everybody. But then we write Pulp Fiction. And I can, you know, I mean, I can even remember up until like um, seeing John Travolta on, on – not John Travolta, um, seeing um, Bruce Willis on MTV – like doing an interview and talking about, I'm about to do this little movie. It's for this uh, young filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino, and it's called Pulp Fiction. And like, he didn't even know what right. it was going to be. That's great. And the movie That's was great. like a small film. What which, year was that now? 90? Mm, that was like 92, 93. Okay. And right. then uh, the movie was released in 94, 94. Okay. Yeah, I believe. And then Those were during the years where, you know, it was the early years of uh, Full Moon and we were distributed by Paramount. We were making one movie in 35 millimeter every four weeks, which was not easy. And I had that huge staff, way more than Empire. We had, you know, everything was heavy lifting and film and bins and moviolas and chems and the frickin'. It's we, had to have, we had 100 people in, the, in those uh, offices churning out these movies. Yeah, well, I, I came back um, from my European trip, and the first thing I did was go visit you guys at uh, Full Moon. And really? One of the first things I did. Wow. The, the I, I, Hollywood and Vine? Uh, yeah, right there in Hollywood now, and Vine. Those were cool. That those, was the old were, Broadway building. Yes, we had the top it was really, really cool. And King King was still there, and I think you guys were making Deadly Weapon. Is that right? Possibly, yeah. It, it was, I think it was maybe Deadly Weapon at the time, which was the Michael Minor movie. He's the guy who yeah. worked on uh, the script for RoboCop. And right. It's kind See, of got a little bit people, of RoboCop I, in I it. I should have a list and go... But I don't have just well. That was a special time because again, LA was popping, Popping. and the next generation of filmmakers, all these LA guys, were right there, and producers as well. Like Lawrence Bender was hovering around that time. We did a show together, and we were all hanging out at your offices, basically. Yeah, everybody's hanging out at your offices. Sometimes I wish I could just zip back and go, okay. (laughs) But during those pretending it to be our offices, Full Moon Moon was doing really well, and we had. I used to say we're making the comic books of the '90s or whatever. The spiel was that was the golden VHS years, and yeah. I know you're VHS yeah. girl, but that's when I went to Can once because we would go there and sell our, you know, set up our office for years, and that was introduced to Quentin. Yeah, he was there because of Pulp Fiction. I'm sure yeah, it was and Pulp he Fiction. probably gravitated right to you. Yeah, it was so <laughs> sweet, and I was so confused. I didn't know. Later, they said, "Oh, he's the." I, I thought he was just. Some fan, of, some, I, some dude, you know, like some I, scary guy who's. No, it was, it was <laughs> cool. It was just at the hotel. He was coming down. It's Quentin Tarantino. Oh, okay, you know, I'm really bad with names on top of it, but yes, that's I, I remember that era really well. And that, that was a lot of fun. Those and so that was days. 1995. And that's when Gala was born. Okay, it was 95. You're yeah. a kid. I child. know. 27. Well, that's a good. My my youngest son, who you met, is exactly the same age. 27. Mm. <laughs> You're two so empire, hilarious. two empires. So, <laughs> th- th- no, I, 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 I just figure I'll give you one of these. Is one of the Paramount screeners. Oh, I'm so excited! Demonic toys. Okay, here are three of my Wizard video. Oh my god! Oh, I'm, box. So, oh, I'm so excited. These are. Yeah, Chris had mentioned these to yeah. me, and I was. So you're gonna get loaded up here. Look at that! I know. And you're gonna get something. See, I mean, just I'm sure your look daughter. At- this is a nice little lunchbox. We have a whole series of lunch. I don't know what to give you, dude. Tonight. No, this it's is a lunchbox. This is the thing, okay. especially because it's you know that'll go on display. <laughs> this will go on oh, a place of honor <laughs> in my home. And I will always keep it within the packaging. <laughs> no, 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 it's funny. I, w- I actually yeah. went on your website. Uh-uh. 
And I was like, oh, man, he's still like the independent guy. Like you're still like – like, and that's really what it was is I gravitate towards like the independent mindset. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not one of the big five. No. You're out there, but you are creating an empire. And when uh, film kind of – and theatrical and all of that went away – I know, to be honest, I hadn't really thought about it in a long time. But right. then in preparing for this, I wanted to watch some on uh, of your things. And so I went on YouTube and then I realized these are just like commercials. Forget YouTube. You, you, I got to give you a, l- a link, link to our site. We have well, that was a just, lot of cool movies. Over that the was just it. I, I, I realized, oh, no, you're doing the exact right thing. The, the kind of posse. It, uh, it's like this technique of the web where you're – Supposed to drive people to your site. Right, you're not supposed right. to put your content on on Eric Schmidt's uh, you know site. You're every, supposed, every they're role, ripping you off, yeah, as you well but, know. Yeah. And so you, you have your so you have like your own place. And I went there and I was like, oh my god, look at this! It's like. It, 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 this is like made for a guy like me. <laughs> you know, it's like you've got all of your stuff there, the Puppet Master box sets and stuff. Of course. That are, um, so, yes, I'm, I am. Other than Troma, you got to give them credit. They are also as long living as – Those guys are you – know, They're still doing their And I'll shit. bet like 20 minutes after he met with you at Cannes, Quentin mm. walked to the Troma booth. <laughs> Probably. And was talking to those guys. But, you know, <laughs> for better or for worse, I've been doing this now for 47 years. And the movie we're about to shoot is number 372. Wow. So, you know, a lot of volume, you know. Well, <laughs> but as Michel Gondry says, mm. quantity will always beat quality. <laughs> I love that. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a huge Tarantino fan, obviously. And his last movie, I thought just, I mean, I don't want to get started because I'll uh, make people upset because should have won, should have this, should have that. But he's made, what, eight movies or something? Or? That was his ninth. That was his ninth. <laughs> and he's... Nice. So, I don't... Forget your argument about volume because, you know, th- those are Well, he, he's an exception to the rule. But I went yeah. on your website and I saw lunch pails. And I was like, oh. <laughs> are we, Why do we not have lunch pails? We are, we, are, <laughs> uh, we are hookers to the, ba- the bitter end, okay? We are whatever but makes sense. Listen, we – There is a is contra- There is so- a Venn diagram where lunch boxes and, and, and v- DVD digiboxes and box sets all collide together. <laughs> I don't know. By, they're collected by the but same I, But I, I, will, I will say this. We – survive and and make movies based on the revenue from the library and from my no debt no bank no funny investors wow nothing you know if i can't afford to make it because the cash flow is not that good that month then we won't make it so we have done that my hero you're my hero whatever you are i mean there are limitations you know you can only do so much i know what those limitations i mean i never had 10 million (laughs) dollars to make a movie well neither Uh, did i actually the truth is i know four four and a half whatever four and a half was was, uh, that was probably like robo jocks or even well that was more than robo (laughs) way more than robo jocks way more the only movie actually Ironically, of the many, many years that is probably closer to four million, three point something, is literally a movie that has been being produced for forty years. It's called The Primevals, and oh, what, yeah. and the story of The Primevals briefly is: I met Dave Allen, who was such a talent in the seventies, because I was dying to have some stop motion animation shots in one of my early movies, yeah. and I had this idea for this movie called Laser Blast. I mean, great, <laughs> like the one of the most important films <laughs> of my childhood, and I think maybe one of the most important films of my, uh, Michael Miner as well, because Possibly. Deadly Weapon is genetically connected. But, you know, a pretty simple theory. It's a revenge story. You know, very careless aliens leave their their weapon in the desert, and this kid finds it. He starts blowing up all his you know tormentors. And then the aliens re- literally realize, oh, shit, we left the weapon. And they turn the spaceship around, really lame. And boom, they come back to Earth to get the weapon. But I wanted to stop motion animation, and I could barely afford it. And then I met Dave Allen. He made me a great deal. And I love the, all the stuff that he's done for me over the years. But he said, Charlie, if you ever make any real money, I have a pet project. I'd love you to make it. It's called The Primevals. Kind of a lost horizons and ancient aliens. And it was a great, big, enormous project. But in the 90s, when things were great briefly, with Paramount and money was rolling in, I said, David, it's time. Let's make the primevals. So for us, it was un- unlike our usual two- to four-week shoots. It was a 12-week shoot. I had a studio in Romania, which was amazing for a while. We built these insane sets. The picture finally wrapped. My dad was the, um, the producer because he needed to be there with Dave because Dave had, had not directed any movies prior, just done a lot of great animation work. And the plan was, which is unbelievable to think about, now it's time – to spend a year and a half and do 250 stop motion animation shots. Now imagine you spent all the money, you got the movie in the can, you've spent a lot of dough, and now these guys one frame at a time <laughs> are gonna do the stop motion animation. Mm-hmm. But that was the plan. And about a year into that year and a half, Dave Allen passed away. He yeah. died of cancer. And that was literally the same time where the Paramount deal was over, our fortunes 
turned again. Think, we, we weren't, there were no mobiles to roll yeah, across no. the street, but it was, we had to get small, which we did. And I literally packed up all the primeval's material and put it in boxes until things got better. And about three years ago, things got better. So for the last three years, uh, Chris Endicott, who was Dave Allen's right arm guy and great stop motion animator, brought some animators back and we funded the completion of all those shots. And it's coming out this year, finally. Wow. Yes, finally. it's being it's being premiered at a real big film festival. I'm, I'm not supposed to say who and where, but whatever. I figured, unlike my normal routine, which is the minute something's finished, get it out there, make some money. <laughs> yeah, 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 no time is... to waste. This movie deserves, you know, it, it looks like a Ray Harryhausen movie. It's very retro. Oh, I'm so excited it's, now. It's very wow. exciting. It, I'll tell you, the commercials for Laser Blast or the trailers for it <laughs> yes, yes. back in the day, that little moment of the alien. I know. You know, that know. little – for Roger mm-hmm. back then, what year was that, 1970-something? Yeah, well, you were like 70, two years old or something. You are a kid. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was a kid of like an insect staring right. <laughs> at the flicker of the screen, like looking at your animation there. Mm-hmm. That was enough to sell me on the movie. And then I went and saw the film. And then what I loved about the movie, which – is actually what disturbed me as a kid, but it's what mm. stayed with me about that movie was that using the gun kind of turned him into kind of a messed it, up. Evil. It ruins him. Yeah. The gun has a negative yeah, yeah. effect on him, yeah, well, and, of course. and that it's like was a, a drug, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like a drug. It was like it became yeah. kind of a very ethical moral laser blast story. would be the perfect big reboot today because it's very simple to understand. It, it has all the elements that people seem to like. It's a comic book movie, anyway. That's another conversation, but. Um, <laughs> well, we, well, we are going to be talking after this. We got to connect. We got to come up because yeah. I know you're a filmmaker, and I want to jump she cut. Produced right. my last movie. Yeah, I oh, I didn't last, know that. Yeah, yeah. So his last two talk films. a bit about two films. You know, yeah, he's said enough now. You're yeah, I am like spiel. blah blah blah. No, no, no. You're, more it's, it's, about it's, the past. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But what are you doing, Gala? What's the story? Well, okay. So when I was ten, my dad gave me <laughs> a Final Draft, and he said, "Okay, you have this idea for a story. Go write a script." Wow. And good I for wrote you. my very first script, which is hidden in a drawer somewhere because it's not. It's actually a really good script. It's not. I don't think. Can I, I, can I pitch it a little bit? If you'd like. I mean, it's kind of a freaky idea. I, yeah. I don't know if I made it freakier by suggestion or. The thing is, I grew up with my dad my entire life showing me whatever he wanted to show me at whatever age. I was just talking with someone that I saw a faster pussycat kill kill at 12. Oh, what a great. At 12? At yeah. 12. Oh, Roger. <laughs> well, it, it, it seemed mean... okay in the moment. Like, I think about it now and it's like, oh. Uh, but I like mean, I would show her like, hey, you want to watch a comedy? Let's put on the Tenant. Okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I grew up watching like Fantastic Planet and Baron Munchausen, and like those were like my yeah, childhood absolutely. movies, and they yeah. completely shaped me. Prince into of Darkness. Prince of Darkness. <laughs> like, you turned out all. I awesome. turned out all right. Yeah. So I think well, my means... children now adults, same thing. Yeah, I know. We, but I, I wouldn't have done the Faster Pussycat. Oh, thing, but you know? but well, also age twelve. That's you're probably a mature twelve. Uh, faster Pussycat is less racy than people think. There are uh, everybody has a ample cleavage, but it has that veneer of age anyway so it kind of and I think you know it looks the kind hardest of thing in the movie is when Tura Satana like breaks that guy's back <laughs> like she puts her foot on his back and then lifts his arms behind him and kind of and it is so visceral yeah thinking about it now it gives me the you know skeeties. again not to super digress but before my dad made all those spaghetti westerns mm-hmm. he made all those epics Hercules uh, yeah Last Gloria Troy and he had me act, which I learned quickly to hate <laughs> like, in these movies. But I played the son of Steve Reeves in, oh, in wow. The Legend of Aenea, which I forget what the title was here. Literally, the son of Steve Reeves. First, they curled my hair because I had to kind of look like him. I hated that idea. And yeah, I, I'll, next time when I come over, I'll bring some pictures of me with Steve Reeves. And, hey, and, we making your hair nice and curly. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and several of these movies were shot in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Like, we make our hair curly. At the time, they, they had these weird co- – oh, yes, that's exactly what it's it was. It's a different accent. That's what it Same was. guy, different accent. But those epics, you know, again, all those effects, which sometimes were amazing, they're all in camera. This is before all the trickery yeah. today. So these guys who had to do these effects, a lot of them were like former muscle men. I mean, these guys knew their stuff, throwing people around. And as a little kid, kind of your experience, yeah. I was around that same age, 9, 10, 11, just watching how they would do this stuff all in camera. Yeah. And I mean, I grew up like on set and stuff. It's like when he was making Rules of Attraction and I traveled to go on the set of Silent Hill, which was a blast and was spooky and cool. fun. I'm going to watch that. See, I'm, I'm, I got to catch up here. I'm, yeah. It's but embarrassing. Yeah. I haven't seen at least Silent Hill. I mean, that seems right up. Uh, Number one at the box office that yeah, year. Okay. Right. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know, I know. No, but actually it's, uh, it's, it, it, it works. It actually works really well on video because I'm the, sure. 
Um, at the time, you know, the movie shot on film, but all of the darkness stuff we chose to shoot on vid- on digital because, mm-hmm. you know, digital loves dark. It loves right. blacks. Right. And so we were able to capture blacks that at the time didn't yeah. really so cool. exist on film. Yeah, as I said, I'm. it makes no financial sense whatsoever, but I'm tempted to make a few of our movies this year back on film. Give me 35. I'm just not such a, I'm just not a fan of digital. I'm not a fan of CGI. I'm not a fan of any of these big cartoon movies. I mean, I can really spiel, but I'll save that for another day. Gala, I have to do a sidebar. Sidebar. Like a little <laughs> sidebar. Film, sidebar time. Sidebar video time. Video <laughs> sidebar for a moment. We're going to get back to the his, your history. No, because, is... I mean, I'll jump in with the sidebar because I, too, have my gripes about uh, so good for digital. You. So, you know, I shot all of my movies on film. Right. And, uh, and actually, Burt Gladstein. You remember him? He's yes. one of the editors at. Uh, oh my place. god! Now he, some, suddenly I see him now. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you see that strange. The, 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 <laughs> he, well, he was strange. Yes, he was. I'm he sorry. was strange, sorry, but he Bert. took me under his wing when oh, I was there. Wow, he was like, "Okay, okay uh, oh, you're into a movie, right, like right, right. you know, okay." So he he w- still cut on a moviola, and he used to t- like he, he basically did what the film school was unable to do was he got me excited right. about editing because he was like, "Look, man, a moviola." Because you guys had flatbeds and stuff. We but he, did. He we was mostly all that. And, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but he was even those beautiful steam projectors beds. that yeah. you worked with. All that stuff. You know. Well, it's it's a big that uh, that room. The the screen, screen room became room. a racquetball court because the place became yeah. a gym afterwards. And so. Oh yeah, I keep thinking. You were there during the early full moon years where we had another screening room. You visited those offices, the former hall, Broadway building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I visited those. That was a cool screening room, too. No, but you had the Empire screening room, and, too. But so Bert, um, he was like, look, uh, Moviola has a break, a hand break. And when you break, when you're making a cut, it's a physical act. It's right. something that you you throw your body you into lean it into emotionally. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. You lean into it. Yes. You, you it's clack, 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 right. and you're holding onto a roll of film, and it's running through, and da, 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 and you, right, right. You, you you jump yeah, into it. Of course. And it, and it's this physical kind of experience. You're, you've got a gas pedal, <laughs> and you've got a brake, yeah. and you're like you're editing. You are editing this. You're editing little stained glass windows. Yeah. Basically. Well, not to mention the thing, the tape, you know, all that is part of that process. Reconstituting I know, it, and it stuff like that. It was a ballet of uh, crazy. Sure, it was a little bit of a hassle, but there <laughs> there was a kind of um, physicality and a physiology to, to how you interacted with the medium as you were making it, which is not the same. Like, um, Rules of Attraction was the first feature film, studio film, sh- edited on Final Cut Pro. We basically did proof of concept for Apple right. to make it so and uh, helped, you know, with uh, developing the, like, the what was it called? Mm-hmm. Film logic or whatever right, right, it was right. so that we could do the frame matching to yeah, 24, yeah. you know, from video. So um, so I helped pioneer that. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is tapping on a space bar <laughs> is not the same as jumping onto, you know, on the moviola onto that handbrake. And, you know, there are people watching this and listening to it who are in their 20s probably thinking, what a bunch of dinosaurs. Who wants to do that? Beep, 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 beep. Anybody can make a faux movie at home. Yeah, and it feels know? like that. But it yeah. feels like that. And, I and when, I'm, and, I'm not okay, arguing. So I'm let's, just let's just talk just for a moment. And we got to get back to side Gallagher. Gallagher. We will, we will. There's plenty of time. <laughs> I'm here. This camera can roll for hours. You know, your dad is a man of a few million <laughs> You know, I, I just, know. Just, just yeah. <laughs> awesome, though. Okay, so you shoot a movie. Um, uh, remember the old days? Uh, the adage was, at the end of the day, the back of your neck will be sunburned mm-hmm. because you want the sun behind you right. on the uh, on your subjects, and right. you're that's you, you plan your day like that basically when you're shooting. Okay, video because of the lack of um, or digital cinema as right. people like to call video these days, because of the lack of depth that you get from the sensor. It just works differently. And so they have to rotate 180 degrees and shoot into the sun to catch lens flares and to create the illusion of depth. Right. Okay. So on film, uh, you know, there's this silver chemical process as the light travels through the gate. We're going into a deep. It's magical. Deep film dissertation. Yes, I agree. There's an alchemical process that occurs and you send it to the 
you send it to the alchemist back at the right, castle who right. has a potion <laughs> and he puts your 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 work into the potion mm -hmm. and he does something and there's some kind of alchemical process that takes place All true. and you end up with these little stained glass windows the next day you don't even know that you have it uh, the surprise until the of, next your, day. of your dailies and hoping the that you know, hoping that it's in focus but for me that there's not a, from all a hair of that, in the gate which I, I mean looking at since i've made all these movies and up to i was like the last holdout i wanted to shoot on 35 and finally it was like charlie what are you doing I had to eventually make that transition. And the worst, I'm sorry, Gal, this is, he started this whole thing. This is important. No, that, no, She'll actually, jump in on this. This is important okay, because people that are in their 20s need to know about this. So, <laughs> so the worst period for me, having always shot on film and then transitioning, and now it's digital even though we're making changes, was, and maybe you're involved in this transition, is when I was convinced, okay, you can still shoot on film, but edit on tape and, yeah. and post on tape. Yeah. I hated that now looking back because I have about 15, 20 movies that we shot that way where we never cut the negative, whereas prior to those movies, all my all the negative was cut. So easy enough to go and get the negative, those that I was able to find because mm -hmm. not everyone uh, – and you make your transfer 2K, 4K, some kind of K, and you're there, and that's fine. But to go back on a movie where you shot maybe 30,000 feet and you have to match cut – that material to create a negative to then do a nice HD or whatever the hell the master is. I hated that period too. That was a, a big sidebar. Like most people are asleep. They, they've arrived at their destination. It's no, like, it's not. Uh, but you know, it's, that's. It's, it, it is a physiologically different medium. It is. And the, even the way that we interpret the mm -hmm. images off I of agree. the screen I is agree. different. Like, and these guys are, who are shooting this are like, they're, they're good film, film. I mean, we all want that. The other thing for me, just on a just silly, I'm at home, I sometimes zap through our own streaming site on Amazon or wherever, and I'm looking at my older stuff, and then I'm looking at the more recent stuff. And, you know, we have good DPs that's well timed, the digital stuff. But it's still, it's got a softness I don't like. You know, film has a sharpness. I, the blacks are, I, whatever it is. <laughs> It looks different. Yeah. Every, why do, why do movies no longer look like movies? Why does TV right. no longer look like TV? Right. It, it, it's true that it's something new and it's something different, yeah. but it looks more like a Mexican telenovela it's, or it's, something it's than, sure. a, it's, it's a than, video game, than a movie that's shot on right, Gala, jump on cut film. back to you. So, Wait, but hold yeah. on a second. Oh. Just, because, <laughs> no. just, because, I mean, yes. just because there's watercolors during the yes. British yes. Uh, renaissance of watercolors in the late 1800s and suddenly mm -hmm. watercolors became the thing didn't mean that you threw away all of the old uh, oil masters just right. because one medium is gone like it's the other thing is in projecting film is something you can't most people can't get at home right you don't watch a movie on film at home and it right. genuinely is special since we've been going to to, to, to the new beverly the all new beverly. the time oh, can, yeah. i mean you can attest to well it i mean probably. especially i mean we just we just went and watched The Loved One, I think, which is one of the most important movies because wow. of the real changes. And we were talking about how the projectionist really plays a huge role in your experience of the film. Because if you have a good projectionist versus a, a bad projectionist, <laughs> it completely Sorry. changes where they make their little things sure. and if they hit it correctly. And film, just the experience of not having your cell phone, sitting in a theater oh, all I together, looking at the me. screen yeah. – and actually experiencing something as a group as where you, audience, you're yeah. capturing magic. Right. It's – you can't – And I'm not – Also, a, you're mean, using persistence of image when you're looking at a still image. And, right. and your brain is stitching those images, those still images you're together. You're an active participant. And you're an active participant. It's activating uh, beta cycles in the brain. Video, even progressive scan video, is using refresh rates. And mm -hmm. refresh rates activate mm -hmm. alpha cycles in the brain. So physiologically, we take in these mediums differently. Right. So not only does it look differently, not only do we are shooting completely different directions, not only has like the, cine the, the, the filmmaker process, like my first film, I couldn't afford a video tap. Right. So I stood next to the camera. Of course. And That's looked how at the I actors. was trained, right there. Exactly. Right and there, trusted right there. My, my DP yeah. to tell me, did we get it? Yeah, yeah we got it. Right. And then you would see the next day, we yeah. did get it. Yeah, yeah, and it was yeah, like yeah. lightning in a bottle. Now we can let the, we, you can let the tape roll. People are talking in the middle of takes. Well, it's also a They're discipline like, hey, to, uh, today. Go back and again, do we got to get off. We got to get Forget off this because it's just depressing. <laughs> well, no, but it's not look, depressing because you're going to start. You're going to make movies on film I'm now. Gonna start, At least yes. so you've told me. I'm so you've to, promised no, me, no, no, and it is it's, testament. I never now said on this. promise. No, but <laughs> we, we are exploring. Yes, we will. We'll Unless you edit it out of this show, Charlie Band's next movies are going to be shot on film. We we will shoot a few on film because we just have to to try to turn some of this around. Even though it's not an affordable venture, you know. There's also to finish, and then we got to cut back to absolutely. There's also a, a discipline that, again, in low budget land, 
raw sock is expensive. So we used to also use short ends yeah, all short the time. Ends, yeah. Short it ends, takes... for those who don't understand, you know, you could buy a nice thousand foot roll from Eastman Kodak and the big studios would buy those rolls. And then by 700 feet, they'd rip it off. And then they would sell the 300 remaining feet to a short end house. And we'd be there, hello, we'll buy all your short ends. Yeah. So it's the cheaper discipline- cheaper than buying the, the full- much re- Oh, yeah. much cheaper. But the discipline was, okay, we're trying to shoot two to one, which, which is really not easy, but we got really good at that. And in addition, we have to try to figure out, okay, there's a 300-foot short end, a couple minutes, is that going to be enough for the close-up? Or maybe I save that for a thing and I'll, oh, you have a 400-foot or that'll be, you know, you have to, no one thinks of that. Now they did the turn, as you say, they turn it on. They don't even say cut anymore, cut. Yeah. They let the thing roll. Now, editors you know? have to editors have to cut the many takes out of a single take right. now you know, to, yeah. to prepare for it. Right, this well, is terrible. We've gone to an extreme. <laughs> Gala, please, yeah. finish take- this up with some new fun stuff that's not this. It's not this. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so Roger basically just showed me movies like my entire life of great. anything. Right. Like I've seen so many movies I probably shouldn't have seen at so many ages that yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I didn't see Pulp Fiction until I was 18 though. Yeah, I think wow. my films are the ones that maybe you've never seen. Yeah, that he really <laughs> removed me from. But when I was 15, my dad went to jail and okay. it was by far the worst experience of my life. Okay. But that's when we started working together because right. he used to do all of his writing handwritten and he mm. would mail it to me secretly oh, wow. inside of letters and then I would transcribe. And oh I think I transcribed maybe like four or five different scripts for him. Yeah. When I was in jail, like first of all, uh, you're never more productive than when you're chained to a concrete table <laughs> yes. you know, with a golf pencil and a piece yes. of paper mm. and you'll do anything to write. Right. You know, you're right. happy to write. You know, it's like uh, it's the greatest escape. But um, I learned after a while that they would – confiscate and like whenever they would you know okay we're mm. doing a mm. we're tearing a cell apart everybody right. cell everybody gets out go up against the wall they strip everyone naked right, right, right. uh they rip everybody's cell apart and they're looking for contraband they're looking for pruno which is jail wine or they're looking for tar okay. heroin or cell phones oh or whatever okay. and for me they're looking for what what is this guy writing right and they would just take it they would take okay. whatever i was writing so i learned that I, they wouldn't take uh, letters that were addressed to, and, to your family, yeah, right, to my yeah. family or anything, and so I would just, whenever they would raid the cells, I would quickly seal whatever I had been working on up to that point, and those pages would go back to Gala, wow. and it would be whatever script I was working on. Unbelievable! And then yeah, she and that would... was my very first industry job was wow. transcribing. What those. a super buzzkill, man! <laughs> I <know. laughs> like, we're almost at the end of this. I'm I know. Fuck. Okay. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that was my first industry job, and yeah, then right. after that, he just we when he got out, we basically became writing partners and worked together. We worked together on like a Lionsgate TV show for oh, Rules of Attraction. So cool. for and cool. the movies that we produced together, we produced both with Samuel Hadida, um, who's like wild card Sammy, <laughs> right. rest, rest in peace. Yeah, Gala actually like for her first, uh, like was basically dealing with Sammy. And I, you know right. Sammy. Yeah. Sammy was... Uh, uh, was who he is. A dynamic yeah. individual. Yeah. <laughs> Tornado <laughs> Sam. But, yeah, so Uncontrollable I just, gentleman. <laughs> yeah. So I just started working in the industry. And actually, the movie Lucky Day that I produced for Roger up in Canada um, was one of the scripts that yeah. I transcribed when he was in jail. So it kind of right. came full circle there. And then, yeah, we just kept working together. And then awesome. finally, we had this experience to do this podcast. And when did that start? I'm so bad at all this. Well, stuff. actually, during the pandemic, uh, yeah. like you said, your book I, came about well, during the pandemic. Right. Even actually before that, when Lucky Day first came out and when Quentin saw it, yeah. which was right before the pandemic happened. Is that your movie? Yeah, that was the okay. movie that I produced yeah. cool. with Rod, uh, for Roger. Which okay. is basically like if anybody – if you ever watch Lucky Day, it's basically my – it's not my story, but it's – I get it. Yeah. I get it. You know, you put yourself in your work and – sure. And I kind of thought I'll make like a um, – and I don't want to get on the video thing because I shot it on video. Right. <laughs> no, please, no, no, <laughs> but the whole thing tints yellow, which okay. is freaking me out. Even the but poster you, did, did you direct yellow. that? It's my most no, no, yellow he directed movie. it. I, I produced it, yeah, yeah, I it, produced it for okay, him. Cool. But when Quentin saw it and we all started talking again and then COVID hit hmm. yeah. and we were kind of all in lockdown and we oh, were just so like – that's how you began you know, We were like, archive. let's start. I hadn't talked to Quentin in a number of years. Like, you know, the business just gets in the way of – life and right. anyhow he um at one point just picked up the phone and called me and he's like oh my god like uh and we started talking again we were talking and talking and talking and right. talking and he was living out of the country right. and um at the time and uh and so we would just talk like for hours oh and hours god. and hours and then That's at a certain wild. point it was sort of like the joke became we should do a podcast 
And the next thing I know, Gala we're doing started, a podcast. Gala started late. <laughs> that is you know, so cool. So that began a couple of years ago. No, of, actually, uh, just this past year. We're just only in our first really? season. Oh, yeah, we're having yeah. even finished. That I think our so first awesome. season wraps June sixth. I think is the last episode. What a great for dynamic! It. Now, again, I'm 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 not even embarrassed. It's just my life. I only once listened to your podcast because I don't listen to podcasts. Yeah. Last night. And it was Chris. I said, Chris, I, got, I can't be a total moron. I got to, you know. <laughs> and it was, it was Somehow. About, and ironically, it was about Corbucci and Italy. Yeah, and the, oh, yeah. So oh, the study oh, yeah, that just Jen. came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was <laughs> that's right. Django. The whole yeah, pulled, it pulled you right into it. Yeah, it was so, almost made And it was you. really the energy. It's like a super nerd fest. Let's figure. I mean, listen, you guys are just into that. I mean, this is stuff I grew up with watching, and it's just amazing how you've pulled this back into your well, into your lives also, because they they were great fun films. But yeah, one of the great things also is that we actually record inside the archives because Quentin has the entire video archives collection oh, on it. tape, and so we're actually <laughs> in when that in show the, went out when that. Right. Store went out of business, and we were doing the equivalent of moving uh, right, the things across owns, the right. street. Uh, they were selling the inventory, and Quentin bought the uh, he bought all the VHS tapes, that, right. and I bought the laser discs, which was like not the wise move. <laughs> I thought that was, I thought I was being the smart one, as usual, and I wasn't as usual. <laughs> like, right. it was like, yeah, we actually record inside the store, and so it's great. So wait, 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 where, so where do you at record? his house? Inside, yeah. he basically bought. The I think store, it's about six the inventory. Rooms. He bought all the shelves and everything, <sighs> and he set them up in the you know, so cool. And he lives in William Friedkin's old house, and so it's really? like this old, big, you know, old timey Hollywood, Whoa, you know, that's great. manse. Right. And uh, he's got a number of, I guess, guest rooms. And you do the show in and this yeah. faux video store. Basically, we're back it's in like video being, archives. It's I love <laughs> like it. being that's inside so cool. of the and store. And we're it's in the freaky. western. We're in the western section and the classic <laughs> section, and then there's a kung fu section that he has created which video where, archives did when not you go to the spaghetti western section or is that kind of in the I think it's kind of like mixed, mixed into the westerns yeah, I, think there aren't Quentin, that many. Quentin, I think Quentin just puts them in the westerns right. uh, I mean unless there's every film is its own judgment on where it kind of belongs <laughs> and it's up to this debate this is so cool like there are some that. movies that you know you would think oh well that goes into the well, we uh, talked about section like the, Jam- like the James Bond films we talked about why aren't they in the British section but they're in the action section right. because someone uh, would want to rent them from action anymore. exactly like I mean they whatever. quiz me constantly they're like where would this movie go and I'm like <laughs> oh. they didn't have an action Good section at you. video archives so wow. it's like it goes in right, drama so here's what we have to do we have to separately get together and conjure yeah. up a movie yes so you guys can make a full moon movie okay yeah. you know it would be i would finally <laughs> finally <laughs> I, I, I i removed myself from yeah. number five in line to like number uh, how many have you done 300 372 372 so like th- number 300 in line <laughs> well finally it'll have getting to close. be you know certain parameters <laughs> shooting days this that and the other of course like, but that's, we'll, ha- we'll that's, have fun doing that's it what yeah. that's what we're doing i mean you know enjoying this and you know these movies Again, very small budgets. A lot of them I'm very proud of. They've yeah. turned out really clever and well. And uh, I'm going to give you two on the way out. I'm yeah, not here. Great. I've given enough weird stuff here. But I mean, uh, I lo- this weird stuff is like what I live for. So Well, one of them is called Trophy Heads, which is um, – you're going to love it, I think, because it's about a, a, a VHS movie collector yeah. who's a fan of all the great scream queens of the 90s. Ah. And the only way you can figure out to – because they're all fading. They're getting older. Yeah. No one's paying attention. So the only way he can – figure out to keep their flames alive and keep them in the is to um, capture them and cut their heads off you know and put them on the wall house of wax style and you know they become sort of the greek chorus so he's got all the famous and i've worked with all these girls so i actually cast barbara crampton i've got them all i've uh, I've got all the ones you can imagine are in this movie linnea quigley's up there linnea (laughs) brings steve i've got them all they're all this i have it actually (laughs) See, oh my God! There. there you go. Oh, there they are. They really are there. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll dig it. That's a great poster. Thank you. Yes, and then we're going to make a sequel because it has its own little life. So check that out when you have a chance. Of course, okay, yeah. Because the guys are freak for VHS and the Scream Queens, and it's got that. And it's a movie made within our budget range in a, in a number of days. You know, it's relatively limited <laughs> amount of locations. And I'll give you another one on the way out called Head of the Family, which is probably one of my favorite movies that I've made, and that goes back. I mean, Head of the Family is maybe 20 years old, but including all the movies I made in the, the, the golden age or whatever you called it of Empire, Head of the Family is probably up there with Trancers yeah, yeah. and a few others. Yeah, Trancers is, I mean, that was before <laughs> my time, <laughs> but like that was definitely one of my favorite of uh, that was of a the good films one. you did. This, uh, I, that wasn't so, before your, oh, maybe it was, I th- 85, I think it you're was, right. I think it was just, just before. Just mm-hmm. before, like I was there for the, just yeah. the tail, and also, I think also... 
Yeah, I, I think I think it was definitely uh, I was just, just after it's a kind of a blur oh, as I think goodness. back on it. But it also reminds me a little bit. Do you remember that Dennis Christopher movie Fade to Black? Oh yeah, like yeah, uh, that was a good movie. Yeah, good I really like that movie. And so, like, yeah, kind of. But but you know, like in in somebody who's in love with movies and they're just like you know. That's yeah, check that. I want you, you to go. tell me what you yeah, think. Okay. I will. And head of the family, head of the family okay, is in a realm of its own. Yeah. Charlie, just before we yeah. sign off, I just want to say thank you because honest, no, I'm gonna just say it. Uh, Without you, we wouldn't have all of these movies that we do have. That people like me who are starved right. for cinema are revisiting and going back to and pilgriming to and saying like, like when I told my friends oh, I'm gonna watch Robo Jocks, they're like, oh my god, Robo Jocks! Oh my god, I'm so excited that you're gonna see that for the first time. Part because the actual trickery in cinema, it's like the the. What's great oh no, we're cinema. going back into film. Yeah, now. he's. I just want to say, no, it's just not think. even that it's film. It's that sometimes they'll have like little, like little monster puppets that come out of a toilet. And next thing you know, they're swinging on a, a lamp or something. Well, all the even Reanimator. Let's face it, that was all in camera. There's yeah. some pretty cool stuff in Reanimator well, that you from you, Beyond, which was the one I uh, yeah. worked on with you guys. Oh, I remember right, right. one of my ex, the, the best days of my life was. I think it was <laughs> oh, was it Optic Nerve that did the title effects or Probably. somebody. Something like that. I got to drive to Venice, which meant I got to right. go somewhere out of the out of the building. Yeah, yeah. I went to Venice and I got to sit there all day because they had to have me bring back the elements while the guy was working with maggots or something and shooting like the titles for <laughs> Probably, it. Probably, yeah. And that was so cool. <laughs> that was well, so thank cool. You. Yeah, but I just want to say thank you because A honestly, pleasure. without you making these movies, like where would we be right now? Like, yeah, where would Indian? What, what, what would I have? To watch, <laughs> like I'm gonna be on. I watched Castle Freaks the other day, and I'm still thinking about it because it really freaked me out. Uh, Castle, Freak. Castle Freak, Castle Freak, one yeah, Castle Freak. Well, That's God, God, there's not, there's not technically they're all Castle Freaks. If yes, you, they if you are. Think yeah. about we it. were Castle, Freaks. and that was like your family. Ca- or I mean, you guys, no, Mike, no, no, or the the, the Empire's Castle. I, I purchased it out of a crazy auction, and then for an thirty auction. years oh, it was a great days yeah. of auctions. That's in the book. What happened to it? Well, I'm definitely gonna crack open. Yeah, it's it's. I think you'll enjoy it, and you know, it's to be continued right well yeah, yeah let's uh i'm gonna read your book i'm gonna i'm ready i'm watching trophy heads and we're gonna have you <laughs> well, i'm gonna give you head of the family because we can talk you into it movies that are very doable within a budget range but head of the family was actually one of the last movies i shot on film this was uh, well lit on oh was it film no it was tape but anyway you'll and Stuart gordon makes a little appearance in there oh some, yeah yeah, yeah, yes. yeah there's some fun fun stuff in there it's a showbiz kind of film Thank you. Listen, what a pleasure. Great stuff. Thank what, you so uh, much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. What, and what an honor also. Oh. I'm really grateful to be back to my old boss. Oh, stop. That's <laughs> unbelievable. But thanks very much, guys. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Ciao. Ciao.